Facebook is this week's sports chat. A few things to talk about, including uh, including the end of the, the middle school football season, the soon to be beginning of the middle school basketball season, and of course high school and UT football. Well, not a big surprise in the middle school championship game. Oneida, once again, pretty much the unbeatable dynasty. Rolled over Jacksboro 46 to 6. Um, just whatever reason, Oneida always has kids who seemingly are extremely large, athletic, possibly older than the kids at Jacksboro. I'm not sure 100%, but you would think with the success they have, they, they would be the best high school football program in history, but it doesn't quite make it to the high school level for them. And you know, it's not like they're, they're in a district where they play the um, Alcoa's. No, I mean, they're in a district where they play Jellicoe's. Jellico and teams that would be the Morgan County. You know, basically, the, except for Jacksboro and La Follette, essentially the teams they play are the teams that um, go from that middle school and make high schools, the middle schools they beat up. So, I mean, it's like the Morgan County Middle Schools pretty much all have a Morgan County High School. And in Claiborne County, that's just the size of school they play, so I don't know why it doesn't translate. But their middle school program is just like it's an unstoppable juggernaut. It is. We call it the Big Orange Steamroller, and they run that single wing off, you know, and it's, it's just up and down. It's everybody that plays, no exceptions. Everybody that plays, so I say it's, it's just this thing, but they roll you over, chew you up, spit you out. I, I'm not sure, I guess it went this started like 10 years ago. Yeah. And pretty much has been maintained at least the last 18 years. Jacksboro has the one win over them in the regular season. That's one of the only games we might have lost in the last six or seven years. But, uh, who knows? What will happen with them? Maybe at some point in the future they'll fall through. But right now, you know, it's going to say hats off. Oh, Heath Sexton's a great coach. Six, a great guy, seven, too. Whatever championship, essentially in a row. Well, they didn't have championships last year. They had the bowl game at uh, this level, at that level. But uh, don't know how to win them all. And that's just, uh, you know, Jack Squirrel's going to have to find a way in the fall it, to somehow improve and get better and see if they can make a little more competitive. It'd be interested to see a uh, combined. James Brown will follow the game. At that point, it would make such a large team. I don't know how much. I, I don't know if they know how to play them. They may. I don't know. They may, may play with Stewart. They played. They played when um, North Middle and Avery Trace were in. They were roughly the same. North Stewart combined two Lenore or Loudoun County area middle schools to make one large team. Um, I, I don't think that will ever happen. James Brown will follow. No. It, too much rivalry, too much money to me. High school, Campbell County, coming out of their off week, a big, big, big game Friday night at Oak Ridge. I mean. It, this is as big as any game of the prize era because this determines home field of the playoffs. Uh, it would be just such a major accomplishment to go in right here. I mean, it would be the first time they ever beat Oak Ridge at Oak Ridge. Only the second time beating them ever. It would, like I said, it would cinch, clinch a, a first round game at Campbell County High School in the playoffs. Which would just be huge again for the community. Three years in a row hosting a playoff game. It would mean your opponent's going to be a, a lesser opponent than the one you're going to go on the road and face. And they're going to have to make quite a road trip because it's looking like it's going to be McMean. Yeah, that's uh, pretty far down there. It's not as bad as it could be, but it's still pretty far down the valley. Hey, Campbell County actually played McMean County in regular season just as a just as a non-district game during the Jim Chadwick years. That's been 20 years ago. But that's the last time that I know of the schools have met. They've only met twice that I know of. Uh, it's, just like I said, a lot of ball rides on this game. It's going to be tough. Oak Ridge is really good. They, they're the only ones that even had a moderately competitive game against Farragut this year in the district. Farragut still beat them pretty badly. Uh, but they can be had. They, they run a version of the uh, auction off. They don't throw the ball around a lot. Which is amazing because they have Key Higgins who's... Campbell County's weakness on defense this year is that they have what they have more has been against teams that can throw the ball. But they, they had a little trouble with Bell County's auction a few weeks ago too. Aided by some passing friends called Bell County had to pass. Campbell County's defense is 
kind of just uh, this all against the run. They've got to continue to do that. Josh Lay's hell is a question mark. It will probably be a question mark till game time. So he didn't break his shoulder, but he, he hurt his shoulder. His collarbone area. We'll see how that works. Zach Ruther's back and able to play. Did pretty well in the, in the last game out against uh, Carnes in the blowout win. We'll see if Josh, Zach, we'll see who starts. I mean, you don't know until the game starts. And Coach Price probably not going to, you know, come out and tell, you know, Oak Ridge anything about it. Right. So, you want them to prepare for both quarterbacks. So that's two radically different quarterbacks. Very different style. I mean, I still would love to see a play or two where they line Josh up in the backfield and Zach beside each other shoulder to shoulder. Snap it one or the other. I mean, you come up confusing the defense. Well, what defense do you run at that point? Yeah. If you know, if you've got the, the guy, so you uh, people out. I would go four wide instead of five wide. And let Josh in the backfield, both of them back in the shotgun. Zach and Josh both. I mean, you've got over his spread at that point. You snap it straight to Josh. And he's probably going to find a running lane and rip off 10, 15 yards. Uh, they time the box up. One of those receivers is going to be free. Yeah. Josh would have snapped to Zach at that point. Nothing else. Josh drifts out, stands up and throws it to Josh. Hopefully you got some receivers out there blocking for him and there's another potential big gain or let's say they come in and bring some people close. You got some free spots out in there in the back of their defense to, to throw the ball down the field to say. Or you can even you know, do the same thing, throw and have Josh throw the ball already. I mean, it would be an interesting thing for me to see. I don't know if Price Coach Price will actually run that at any point ever. I really never saw a quarterback a team rely on two quarterbacks up in the backfield at the same time and snap it to one or the other. But I think it would be interesting. I think it would be something to see. And, and the, re the reason you could do that is that Josh Lay is so athletic that if he were just back there as a running back, you would be fine handing him the ball. And he's a capable player. He can block if he needed to. Obviously, he can catch the ball well. He's just such a versatile player. You don't see players like that very often. No, Josh is a he's a rare breed of athlete. Um, <coughs> he's he's just so multi talented, and even even what we've not seen a lot of this year is how good of a defensive player he is. Yeah, that was unfortunate because the secondary and the linebackers both. I mean, Honeycutt said he wanted linebacker. Cody Sewer wanted strong safety. They were going to play them in both spots there. And they, they lost that aspect. That, that would have made the defense even better. It's already been a strong defense as it is. And especially that front four on defense. Front three, they run the three four, but they off the three, somebody getting on the line of scrimmage. But it just didn't work out that way. But Campbell County's it's been a solid season no matter what happens. You're in the playoffs again. I mean, uh, as we said, coming off a year, we lose three All State players. And some of the most productive records that but I mean, Ethan Jeffers, every passing record in the book. Joseph Elkins, almost every receiving record you could have. Uh, Trey Torres is just special. Trey Torres has all state, all over the field, defense, offense, kick returns, throwing them all. Preston Miller. Preston Miller had a 102 yard reception, interception return a couple of years. That's a school record. You've had multiple school record holders, all state players, leave that team. And just like I said, two extremely good offensive linemen in, in Spencer Roberts and, and Patrick uh, Ride, who just been flawless at center for since the Anderson County game of his sophomore year. I mean, he, he was basically even on the center. I mean, that, that, losing all that, you're still in the playoffs, you've got some big wins, your offense has been a, you didn't go back. And, and it's not like they just eked it. Nice. They beat a Clinton team that just put on an offensive display last week. Went yeah, over seven points last week, but you just—it's been a good, good year time for you too. We say that every week, and it's true. I mean, it's just that Gibbs game to now, and you know the injury happened. That's another thing. The injury happened to, to Zach early on in the first quarter of that game, and it put the Campbell County in a scramble mode and. The offense moved the ball, but just could not quite get them in the end zone. And Central's the only game, and Central and Fairgrove are the games that Kim County really were out of this year. Both Central's proven to be a powerhouse team. I think they're they're nine and one or eight and one this year. And but they had their way with Anderson. Yeah, they blew out Anderson. Uh, well, of course, Anderson County, those jackals wouldn't re-sign the players again because they just, they do. they're bad this year. They may be bad for years to come. 
think, you know, it wouldn't be overly crazy just to see that happen. But Overage comes back up and it's a cleansing exciting program. It's tough for him to compete with that. And the, the, the talent pipeline's dried up out of Camden County. They'll be going to Union County. Union County actually won a couple of games in the last few years. So not, not the race, it's just more success than they're used to have. And that may sort of dry that because Horse Manor's got a good team this year. Horace, Horace Maynard's team was impressive. Well, Jasper will beat a good Horace Maynard team on the road, a team that beat them in the regular season and beat the fall in the regular season to get to that championship game. And I honestly didn't expect that to happen because of the Horace Maynard's got a really strong running back, linebacker. And you get one kid at that level as good as that kid, he makes a team hard to beat him. Just in a second, we saw that before. We saw, so we saw Horace Maynard. We saw Horace Maynard. That, that guy had 25 tackles and 200 yards rushing against Campbell, or just uh, Jasper on one, one game about five years ago. I mean, you get one special player middle school, it's tough to overcome. And the best part of it this year's Cougars was you don't really lose a lot of people. Off You're going to lose a couple of offensive linemen, just a couple. You're going to lose Austin Reigns. You're going to lose a couple of defenders, just a couple. But compared to what we lost, I mean, they're, they're, these guys are probably going to be all district players. Right? So you're going to lose a couple of those guys. But, I mean, Peyton Webb's going to be, Peyton Webb may be a junior. Peyton Webb, Webb is a junior. Mike Webb Rhodes is a junior. Possibly. Peyton Webb may be actually a senior. I no. can't remember for sure. Him and Mike Rhodes went to the middle school. They're the same class, and they'll be, they'll be together. I mean, you just got a lot of guys coming back. Two quarterbacks coming back. That are, I mean, Josh has just had some fantastic games this year. I mean, we'll have to see if that ever actually takes over that role. That may be a senior before he can fully take over the role, obviously. And, and, you know, it's hard to argue – Otherwise, I mean, it's just I, I didn't even suspect that, that Josh would come along and play as well as he did. But then again, Zach may have played just as well, and Zach does fit what Justin wants to do on offense more so. And that's get the ball down the field, and as we saw with Jefferson, Zach's got that big arm, he can get the ball down the field. And Josh got the ball down the field and had great games with the field the time, but against some lesser defenses at some point. But it's just a double threat still. I mean, that's how Justin was going to use the guy. We actually saw some of that in the first game. That, you know, Justin was going to use both guys. Anyway, there are situations, especially Justin prefers to run the ball from the quarterback slot when he's inside the 10-yard line. And it had been Trey, it had been Nick Bailey, and guys like that doing it. And this year, Austin Reigns has tried to do that some. But that's, a, that's an aspect that you can have. And, and for sure, use Josh just look like a, he, he sort of abandoned the Austin Reigns. He did. And, and just left that up to Josh. And Josh has a full rush of touchdown. Campbell County goes in that big package and gets get Josh back there and let him go. Zach, you know, it's third down and 15. He's the guy you want in there for sure at that oh, point. Oh, yeah. Because he can get the ball down the field with accuracy, you know, 20, 25 yards with no trouble. Just run a post pattern over the middle, throw it to your uh, tallest receiver, which Probably be Josh. Probably be Josh at that point. He's a good 6'2", 6'3", very athletic, capable catch. So that's the, the future's bright for the Cougars. And hopefully they can get that playoff, get that money over the edge, host that playoff game in advance. Once you get the playoffs, you never know. You just going to play your best game. You're going to run into really good teams. But there's no bad team. Right. At that point, everybody you're facing is just – but the brackets, at least this year, are going to make a lot more sense. We'll see. We'll see how that works out. On the college level, football, painful, just dispiriting loss to Alabama. Some people are actually happy with it. I'm not. Been a field goal kicker. We probably would have won that. Yes. I, I don't understand people coming to the radio with glowing. We're Tennessee. I mean, it's Tennessee. You don't ever, ever, you're never proud or never feel good about it. Ever. For any reason, you don't think well worth really none of that. It's Alabama, they beat you, it's a bad day. There's no good day, there's no positives about it. Nothing good coming back. It's just me, there's another loss to Alabama, that's 10 in the row, it's the most. It's just ridiculous. I, I'm getting beside myself. It's, it's, there's no positives in losing to Alabama. None. I don't care if we rush for 1,000 yards, through for 1,000, you still lost. You lost to Alabama. It's a bad week because of that. And that's the bottom line. I mean, there's no competing. You, you, don't, you don't get prizes for being competitive at this level. You should be competitive at this level. And as Patrick pointed out, Aaron Medley, I don't know what Bus Jones is thinking. No clue. Aaron Medley is now one. 
I'll say one or maybe two of 11 on field goals are longer than 40 yards. Now he's missed two field goals inside of 20. He's good from 30 to 39 yards. He'll make every one of them usually. But he's missed two inside the 20 this year. He's nine for 17. I looked it up, did some research. The NCAA keeps stats for games. And right now the minimum is you have to have seven attempts to, to qualify. Where would you think Aaron Medley is out of uh, the kickers in the nation? Out of the D1 Keep it team. in mind, there's 120 D1 team. And I'll say right now, there's 108 who have qualified. We have seven or more teams. We're only about 108. Well, he's 105th out of 108 kickers in, in the country. He's dead last in the SEC. And not even close. The SEC's top kicker is making 100% of his field goals. The LSU is 9 for 9. And then you cascade down. And the guy from LSU is also number one in the nation. And you cascade down through the kickers all the way down to 11, which is Alabama. As we know, we heard before, their field goal kicker struggled before he played us and made everyone field goals against us. Um, he's struggled. He's at 67% of the show. I think that's always the case, though. Uh, he comes on and gets uh, oh, natural. And my medley is at 52%. He's, he's, he's 15 percentage points lower than the other worst kicker in the SEC. Now, the official, he, he was one of the 10 shy, was Florida's kicker. Florida's kicker was three for six. 50% of the silver. You know what Jim McElwain did at Florida? Pulled him. He benched him and had to open tryouts for a kicker and have, has replaced him now. And the new field goals kicker is this four or five since he replaced him. You don't stick with a guy that's bad. And Bush is so stubborn. He comes out, well, Medley's my kicker. He's a good guy. I'm going to stick with him. And, you know, it's not like we're saying throw him off the team. He's great. Well, he's mean, kicking. You're bringing the whole team down. I know they can say, well, we should have got it closer. We should have did this. And 50 yarders aren't easy to make. I looked it up. 32, 32 kickers in the country have made 50 yard field goals. That's a third of the kickers in the country. Now, some of them probably haven't even attempted a 50 yarder, but could. There's people, they've eight players have hit field goals of 55 yards or longer this year. The guys hit a 60 yarder this year in college. He hit a 51 yarder at Farragut against Campbell. Campbell County, or pardon me, Aaron Medley was supposedly the number one kicker, one would say, in the recurring rankings in the country. He was highly talented. He's got a huge leg. That's why he's kicking the kickouts out of the back of the end zone. He doesn't have a distance problem. He can kick one for 60 yards if he can kick straight. But for whatever reason, when he gets to go forward, he cannot kick the ball straight. He cannot kick the ball through the uprights. He can't do it. He can't. He has no accuracy at all. And it's unfair to Medley, and it's unfair to the, to the team. At that point, you either change kickers or you stop attempting kicks beyond 40 yards. Those are your two choices if you're Bush Judge. Because Trot and Medley out, going to miss another one, does nothing for anybody except for the other team if the ball must be the Now, if you knew there was a, essentially a 5% chance of a play being successful, and that's mainly hitting the field goal longer than 40 yards, he's going to make about 5 And knowing you have that punt that can put the ball anywhere you want. fantastic you punter. Okay, so you're looking at potentially gaining that field position. Or the, the fourth down probability is probably about – 40, 35, 40% chance of getting most sort of down. So you, you have a statistically, the, the, the statistical worst outcome is to attempt a field goal with Aaron Medley beyond 40 yards. But Bush Jones keeps doing it. He did it three times this week. And the 43 yarder, I'm sorry, anybody's got to make that. Yeah, if you're kicking in college, you've got to make and 43. Yards. I looked at the people who had made 50 yarders. They were generally either one for two, two for three, and in, in, in that range, 50, 66%. So you probably should have made one of the 50 yards. So there was no issue with distance. And that's usually the issue with field goal people. Right. Beyond 45, especially beyond 50 yards, it's distance. Manley has plenty of distance. He would have, that, he, he's had some kicks from that length. He would have made it good for 70 yards if it weren't 25 feet to the right or 25 feet to the left. But you just can't keep the guy. You can't keep running him out there. You either, it's, I said it's unfair to everybody on that team. You have to go for it. I mean, you can look at Campbell County. Gustavo is a great extra point kicker. He makes, makes almost every one he tries. But you'll pretty much see Matt Price or Justin Price going for it any time the ball is down there inside the 15-yard line. Because Gustavo, he, he doesn't have the leg to make 35 or 40-yard field goal. At least from, Justin, from Justin's experience with him. 
I mean, so, so he doesn't try. He doesn't force you. Put Gustavo where he's going to have to make a 40 or 45 yard field goal. Um, you know, a good coach knows that. You figure out what's the best way my team's going to have a chance to win. Do I kick a 55 yarder? Do I punt? Most of the time, you're going to punt. In a situation where you have to make it, you can't trot the guy who knows on this. The guy who's never made one of that distance, the guy who, who makes 10% of his kicks at any distance. You just can't do that. And that, that's my rant about that. And the whole Alabama, I'd say no positive about losing to Alabama. Now you have to win every game the rest of the year to even look like a semblance of improvement. And, I mean, the, they should win. There's definitely no guarantees. Oh, so, I mean, there, there's not going to be a game the rest of the year. Kentucky, hear what you might, fear what you might. Think what you might. Kentucky is a bad team. They've not beaten a good team this year. Missouri's awful. Missouri's one of the worst teams. Missouri got beat by me. Missouri has scored 12 touchdowns this year. And that's ridiculous. And they're they're really bad. I mean, Kentucky had to go to overtime to beat Eastern Kentucky. So EKU's in the Ohio Valley Conference. It's Tennessee Tech. Bad, bad team. So you, you, you can't. You got to go up there and you want to blow Kentucky out of the water. You want to blow everybody else out of the water the rest of the way. I can't. Tennessee has the number one strength of schedule in the country right now. It should be. I, I think they should be six and one at worst. I mean, Medley has missed just enough field goals in every game. That we would have, I believe, won, we would have won every game. Maybe, maybe not Arkansas. I can't remember if he missed two at Arkansas. I missed Arkansas or not. But we would have been Oklahoma, Florida. We would have been Oklahoma, Florida, and Alabama if he made two. But there was a lot of other things that could have happened that we would have won too in, under other circumstances. We'd have played a little better on defense if we did this. But when you look at one play, and it's a play that in, in UT's history, we have been fortunate generally to have really good plays. Right, our kicking game was off. Anything else you want to say about the field full man had a kick? Uh, he always had a good kicker. He was one of the few coaches that always used a scholarship on a kicker. I mean, even back for years, Johnny Majors got kickers. Uh, they just emphasized the kicking game for, for years because it's so important. But you had the Reveas brothers. Um, just, but we've had a lot of place kickers in the NFL. Jeff Hall, who made like 200 extra points in a row and probably 75, 80 percent of his field goals. But your field goal kicker's chugging along at 50 percent. And last year, Medley had a pretty good year. He's 20 for 26. But every field goal we kicked, we didn't try that many outside of, you know, 40 yards. Because he, he was one for five outside of 40 yards last year. And 19 for 20 inside of 30, 39 yards. So he, he was not like he was making long field goals last year either. He wasn't. So he's missed them last year. He misses them this year. This year he just added the game where he missed. He's missed two inside the 20, inside the 25 to 30 yard range. He missed two 29 yards. Which I want to say one of those was against Oklahoma too. That hurt pretty bad. Obviously, if he went to overtime, would have won. He'd made the 29 yard against Oklahoma. Most likely. I don't know. It's frustrating, and it's just another close loss against a team that you should have beat. It's another fourth quarter lead we had that we couldn't hold on to. Played great on defense all game long. Faltered on defense again late. Um, Alabama's quarterback. That's the worst quarterback we've probably done to see play. And one of the worst offensive lines you're going to see from Alabama under Nick Saban. I mean, we, we hadn't got some quarterback against anybody all year. We were in that backfield all day long. I mean, there were some bad calls from the S on some holes. There's a video one running right now of the Alabama player with both hands holding, holding Derek Barnett's jersey behind, and one of them he's got him by the neck right in front of an official. But Alabama never gets called for holding. No, no, no they don't. On the year, I don't think they've had to do it. I remember last year we played and they hadn't had a holding call against them all year. I don't think they have one this year. I mean, they clearly do hold a lot of time, and they never get caught. So, there's a lot of bad goes on, and there's no, no positive from losing a game to Alabama. I, mean, I hate them. They hate that Kentucky basketball. No positive from losing. I don't care if you play it close. You get blown out. You lost the game, and it, it, it's a bad loss. You're right. And, and that's about all we got for the week. We'll be back next week with more sports chat.